we'll try to stick. Thanks again, Stephen, for um, for being here today. Um, I'm really excited to introduce for Center of Microbiome Science Science and Action uh, Seminar Series an external speaker, as you know, been an Ohio State focused um, uh, seminar series. But I really wanted to bring Professor Stephen Hallam in because he's been thinking about uh, a side that we haven't heard a lot about, and I'll call it functional medics. Um, thinking about the, the metabolic capacities of cells and how that's important for thinking about the interactions in microbes and ultimately answering uh, and designing microbial communities. His background is uh, he did a BA studying religion and biology at Sarah Lawrence College, which if you know Stephen, that all clicks. He's got a philosophical approach to much of his science. Uh, and then in 2000, he, did his, he graduated with a PhD at UCSD where he was studying uh, uh, molecular and cellular developmental biology, particular synaptic remodeling in C. elegans. Uh, I met Stephen when he became a postdoc at MIT with Ed DeLong, where he started doing a lot of cool functional metagenomic work. Uh, and he moved on in 2006 to University of British Columbia, where he's been faculty in the microbial immunity and infection or infection and immunity department, I and I. Uh, Stephen's not one to let grass grow under his feet. He's also a director of Bioscope Innovation Ecosystem, a director of the Biofactorial uh, Automation Core, and of the Environmental Biobank. Um, Stephen's also run a long-term ecological research program, not a formal LTER, but one that's in the looking at one of the more important ocean transects called Line P off of off of um, uh, uh, off of the west coast of Canada and out into the ocean into these large areas called oxygen minimum zone. I'd be hearing about some. And um, Stephen's, of course, been prolific in publishing. He's published well 50 papers. He's been cited 20,000 times, um, many of these in top tier journals. And a lot of what I would consider to be seminal papers in environmental microbiology, which is the words we used before it was called biome science, um, e micro. <clears throat> um, so Really excited to hear what to say today. I think it will resonate with many of us that are starting to think about um, these play microbes and the kinds of metabolisms that they are using to, to control roles and control of in, in natural ecosystems. Stephen, please take it away. All right, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm just going to get my <laughs> talk queued up. So here we go. We're going to jump right in. I'm going to talk to you about um, three main thematic points today. The first, I want to talk about what it means to me when I, I say we live in a microbial world and why that's important and why we really want to understand it uh, at the molecular level. And then I want to take us to kind of an adventure where we try to put the pieces, those molecular pieces back together again to understand emergent properties of metabolism in the context of that microbial world. And then I want to specifically talk to you about uh, software uh, workflows that my lab has built over the years that assist in putting those pieces back together. Uh, and, I, and I call that metabolic pathways for the whole community. And that's a bit of a pun, right? Because we're trying to put together the individual parts of microbial genomes and metabolic potential into a holistic representation of, of how uh, communities function uh, at different scales in biology. But I have to thank all the people, and I, I can't be exhaustive here, but there are some main people that I, I just wanted to highlight whose work is part of today's presentation. And this goes all the way back to the origin of the lab. And we have Dave Walsh uh, with the big head who, who really kick-started a lot of our metabolic uh, pathway analysis and uh, PhD students, uh, Jody Wright, Elise Hawley, Monica Torres Beltran, the current postdoc, Brandon Keefe, uh, a bunch of bioinformaticians who've been incredibly important to this work, uh, Ryan and Aria and Tony and Connor and Shori and Homer, Julia and Aditi. And I also want to highlight this Ecoscope uh, program. This is no longer a training program. The funding has lapsed, but uh, the innovation initiatives that it sparked uh, continue. Uh, it stands for Ecosystem Services, Commercialization, Platforms, and Entrepreneurship. And it works across the four pillars, if you will, microbial ecology, biological engineering, uh, bioinformatics, and, and networking and entrepreneurship. Okay, 
So we live in a, a world dominated by prokaryotic microorganisms. You know, there are an estimated 10 to the 30th power bacteria and archaea on, on the planet. Uh, now, there, in this image taken by Ed DeLong, by the way, many years ago, uh, it's false color, obviously, as an EM, but there are viruses on here, too. And it, it does turn out viruses are more abundant than, than, than microorganisms. And so they actually do play a pretty important role. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. But the point is that these microorganisms uh, represent uh, a distributed network with respect to their, their metabolic functions on a very vast scale. Think about them as CPUs, and now you have 10 to the 30 individual processing units. Uh, that is encoded uh, in essentially uh, 10 to the 33 individual genes. If we, if we normalize an average genome size of about 3 million base pairs at one, thousand base pairs per uh, per gene, we get something crazy like 10 to the 33 uh, open reading frames that represent approximately 10 to the 26 gigabytes of genomic information. And so that's a lot bigger than um, the internet. And this is ancient. It's been around for billions of years. Uh, and collectively, uh, those bacteria and archaea drive Earth's biogeochemical cycles. And if you haven't read this paper, The Microbial Engines That Drive Earth's Biogeochemical Cycles, I, I highly recommend it by uh, Paul Falkowski and, uh, and colleagues. But essentially, this is a wiring diagram of Earth's metabolism at a high level. And, and microbes participate in all of these various um, loops, feedback loops. In fact, Penny Chisholm um, wrote in 2000 a very nice summary of how micro uh, organisms. And in this case, I'm specifically referring to the prokaryotes, but it, it could equally include eukaryotic microorganisms and viruses. This quote, which I think really captures the essence of, of what we're trying to do. The regulation of the pools and fluxes in biogeochemical cycles have their origins in the genetic inventory of individual microbes. So individual cells, this is important, individual cells. And the regulation of the genes within those cells um, is determined by the environment. So there's feedback. As such, one can look at the microbial food web, that's an interesting concept, as a collection of genomes whose expression and replication is coordinated through complex feedback loops at the organismal population and ecosystem level. And I, I rephrase the ecosystem level here to be individual, population and community level. So these are the, the three hierarchical levels that we wanna think about when it comes to metabolism. And, and in, in Penny's quote, microbial food web is the metabolic network that is produced by all of the interactions and those feedbacks between individual cells, populations of cells and the, the whole community. So schematically, we can think about this. Here, the colors represent different uh, microorganisms. We have four colors. There's a red, there's purple, there's yellow, there's blue. So four different types of microorganisms. Each one of those circles represents a cell. Those are the individuals. And we know that metabolic processes happen in individual cells. So there's a, a network of metabolism within a cell. And here we have a, a, a linear transformation. The, there are three enzymatic steps represented by the arrows and, and four substrate so or products, depending on the order you want to think about it. So there's a flux from A, through B to C, and then finally D. And there are three enzymes that mediate that. But what we're learning is that actually population level functionality exists. So that metabolic process could be broken down within closely related members of a population. So they're genetically related, but they distribute that process so that two of those steps might occur in one subpopulation and the final step uh, might occur in a different subpopulation. And the same idea of modularity can be carried out to the whole community level. Think about the nitrogen cycle. It's very modular and different members of the community might specialize. Some might do the complete denitrification pathway, but others might only do the first step of, of nitrate reduction or others might only do the last step of nitrous oxide reduction. So here that, pot, that pathway could be broken down across multiple individuals. So one um, type might specialize in the first reaction, another the second and so on to drive flux. So that idea of metabolic flux now becomes a not just an individual objective function for a cell, it becomes a population level objective function, it becomes a community level objective function. Of course, that's the cellular network. 
that we're talking about here. This is a mathematical construct of correlations between different microorganisms. So this, this network where the nodes represent different taxonomic groups uh, and the edges represent the correlation uh, between them. This is based on 16S, by the way. So this might be the only 16S data I'm showing you today. But here, the, the node size is scaled with the mean oxygen concentrations. Uh, and you, you can see they're colored now in some cases by the taxonomic identity that we can uh, uh, grasp from a, from a database lookup. And there's some interesting features to this network, actually, because we can see that as we go from left to right, high oxygen to low oxygen, the properties of the network are changing. So the, the, the betweenness connectivity these subnetworks form, the number of connections between nodes in those subnetworks becomes denser as we go from high to low energy. Um, and we actually have some indication that the energy stress can drive increasing levels of co-metabolism or molecular microbial metabolic interactions uh, become more important at, under low or limiting energy conditions. That's still being developed as a, as a concept in ecology. But that idea of metabolic coupling is key. And it just reiterates what I'm saying is that microorganisms really don't live in isolation. I know we try to isolate them in the lab. They, they live in populations and communities. They exchange metabolites. So if we're going to understand the metabolic potential that then is translated into ecosystem level functions or phenomena and biogeochemical cycles, global scale, we really need to appreciate these different levels and the emergent properties uh, at each level. So here's an example of the distributed denitrification pathway, where you can see these uh, glyphs that represent different microorganisms, different taxa that specialize in different steps in that reaction. So you have, for instance, this sub-5 proteobacteria that doesn't carry out the last step of denitrification and actually cooperates with other members of the community that, that complete that A to B to C transformation. So we have these foundational questions that we're trying to answer. Uh, some of them we, we can apply 16S to answering, but, but really we need to get into the genomic repertoire, uh, the transcriptomic repertoire, the proteomic repertoire to, to answer them in a more satisfying way. So we wanna understand the taxonomic and functional structure of the community, right? So certainly that's the, the province of, of the 16S. How does the structure change along a gradient or response to perturbation? And again, we can do that to a certain extent using the 16S methods. What are the ecological and biogeochemical consequences of this change? And, and finally, what are the relevant units of selection, conservation, and, and I argue increasingly utilization within microbial community? So how can we harness what we're learning about structure, function, that potentiality uh, with actual use, whether it's through uh, some kind of um, augmentation in the environment or, uh, or, or directed biological engineering? And the most fundamental conceptual takeaway for today would be represented is represented here. So I just want to walk through this a little bit uh, so that we're all on the same page. So what you see is a dendrogram, and I'm trying to reuse the color scheme that we we saw in the network to a certain degree. Uh, this dendrogram, think of it as a, a phylogenetic tree, where uh, the tips of the tree might represent species. So rank four could be species. And then as we move up towards that common, that universal common ancestor, you know, we're going through the different uh, taxonomic ranks that you might find in the NCB hierarchy. Uh, and then anytime we move up from the tip, there's a common ancestor. And so we call that the lowest common ancestor for a given rank. And so if you've ever worked with uh, 16S data, you'll, you'll know that you might get some placements all the way down to the species level, where you might get some down to the genus level, some uh, at the family level, right? There, there's a variety of placements based on what's in the database. Um, and from a functional perspective though, this becomes a really interesting problem because here's that metabolic process, that linear process, the flux that goes from A to B to C to D. And I told you there are three reactions. And those reactions can be encoded, um, the enzymes that, that carry them out can be encoded in multiple different microbial units. And so what we're trying to figure out is like, what is the frequency distribution of all of the open reading frames that are encoding reaction one and all of that allelic diversity at the individual level, the population level and 
of course, the community level. At the individual level, well, maybe it's a single copy gene, maybe it's a multi-copy gene. The population level, there's going to be allelic diversity. Um, and at the community level, there's going to be modularity. And you're going to have some taxa that contribute one reaction, some that contribute maybe all three reactions to this process. So under one state, one environmental set of conditions, we might see that this green lineage is dominating the reaction sequence. But then under another environmental state, this perturbation state, we might see a shift towards some of these other taxonomic lineages. But the challenge is, if we have fragmented information and we can't link accurately the taxonomic label, then all of this information uh, becomes uh, imprecise. So one of the things I want to talk about today is how do we improve the precision such that we can identify these frequency distributions uh, and what they might mean from a modeling perspective with, with more accuracy. So let's let's talk about how we put those pieces back together again. And I, I've already alluded to the, the problem space. We, we want to sequence the, the gene, so the genomes, if you will, of the microbial community as a whole. And then we want to work backwards uh, from the community level to the population and the individual. If we can get individual genomes, that would be ideal. And so the problem from a simple formal statement is that you know, if the metagenome, that's the community level genomic state, G sub M, is equal to this, uh, this sum of all the fractional abundances of, of each genotype in the sample. So that's a, that's a dot product. Um, and, you know, high diversity samples are going to be more complex. There's going to be lots of those fractional abundances to contend with. You know, an isolate, that's an N of, that's one. So there's one genotype. Uh, and and that's easy. But, you know, when we go out into the environment, that can be 10,000, it could be 50,000, it could be 100,000 or more. And so we're trying to sequence through that. And then we're trying to put all of those pieces back together again into meaningful genotypes that we can use for metabolic reconstruction so that we can accurately assign the colors and the frequency distribution. And the simplest way to do that, and this is the traditional gene-centric approach in metagenomics, that you're probably all familiar with is to simply say, okay, we know that that uh, there are these molecular machines. They might be made up of different protein parts. So think of uh, the ATPs, or uh, 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 think of a multi-subunit protein complex. Uh, think about the, the the energetics within the cell and all the different components that that are responsible for creating a proton motive force. Uh, so that's a that's a complex machinery, and we can go and look based on homology for those different parts, uh, and we can say yes, that process is probably there because we can find n number of parts. But if you're dealing with a metagenome, you also want to assign who those parts belong to, and that's non-trivial to do accurately. Another way is to take the pathway-centric approach and to say, okay, rather than just looking at the individual machinery and you know the components of that machinery. Let's look at how those reactions are connected to each other within cells or between cells. And we can have, uh, in this case, we're using an enzyme commission number to represent that. Um, and then we have substrates and products. So this is a keg map for the nitrogen cycle. And so then we can take the genes we predict from the metagenome and we can just throw them at this pathway. And we can say, well, which of those lights up? And we can say, can we define flux from A to B to C to D through these different reaction sequences. Uh, but again, we have the same taxonomic labeling problem. If we're working at the community level, it, it's much harder to know if this is a community level objective function, a population level objective function, or in fact, from individuals that have the complete pathway. And of course, the solution is we tend to go with the panoramic approach where we try to bin our metagenome. So after we assemble the reads, the, fa the FASTQ reads into contigs, we try to put those contexts into a, a genomic context based on variable uh, piece of information contained in those. Uh, and so then we have a collection of contexts that are likely to belong to a given uh, population genome. So here, each of these would represent a, a, a bin of contigs assembled from reads that are likely to go together. So you can think about this as if you had a lot of different puzzles you mixed all the pieces together and you started sorting out these pieces belong to this puzzle, these pieces belong to this puzzle and so forth. Uh, that's that's pretty much the state of the art today, unless you start to think of long read sequencing to get it or single cell sequencing, which we'll talk about. And then finally, we want to put all that information back together. So ideally, 
this 16S network, we can actually identify the genotypes that are associated with each node in the network. And if we can do that, wow, now we can start to really think about ecological interactions through the lens of metabolism. And that's really what we're trying to do right now. That's the current state of thinking about the problem. However, I want to provide a cautionary tale. I like this image because what is the, you can see the projection are three different shapes. And you might've noticed I used the same shapes around gene-centric, pathway-centric, panoramic views. So three different ways of looking at the same parent shape, right? That's, that, that's perplexing. So depending on my point of view, I might see a square, I might see a circle, I might see a triangle. And that's our current challenge when we, when we try to do the metabolic pathway reconstruction. And it has to do with exactitude in science. So here's where I get to be a little philosophical. I apologize in advance, but it's important because precision, we're not gonna be perfect in this because we're really taking a, a lot of information and there's gonna be some loss and there's gonna be sequencing error and so forth. But, but we would like to put those pieces back together again as, as, as accurately as possible. And so to quote Baudrillard, who's a, a cultural philosopher, right? In 1981, writing in, um, in a book that actually inspired the Matrix movie, today abstraction is no longer that of the map, the double, the mirror, the concept. Simulation is no longer that of a territory, a referential being, a substance. It is the generation by models of a real without origin or reality, a hyper real. The territory no longer precedes the map, nor does it survive it. And why am I saying that? Is because when we take the data from the environment, that's as close to reality as we can come. This reads came from that sample. But when we assemble them and create bins, population genomes, those population genomes do not exist in reality per se. I mean, they, they're digitized representations of the information we have abstracted from the environment. But that genotype may not be a genotype that you could find an individual cell manifesting, right? It's a, it's a construct. And we have to be aware of that and what the limitations of working with that kind of information might be. So I, I like to structure things along a genomic information hierarchy where we start at the tip of that pyramid. And that's an isolate. That's an organism that, or a, a phage that you have in the lab that you've individualized and you've sequenced its genome. And you can be precise with your taxonomic label. I know what the name of that entity is because that's the entity in and of itself. And there are different levels of curation associated with that individual. Uh, I'm using the, uh, the, the metapsych hierarchy here from SRI. And there might be three levels. One where you have highly curated genotypes like E. coli, where there's lots and lots of information about the, the enzymes that are encoded and their, their metabolic functions down to you know completely machine uh, curated where no one has actually looked and, and asked is this correct or not. Single cell amplified genomes, which we'll talk about in a minute, are also individuals. They come from the environment. We might sort the cell from uh, the ocean water and amplify its genome and sequence it, but it's in incomplete. Here, in the case of an isolate genome, we might have a unity. We might have closed that genome, uh, that circular genome. We have all the, the information single cell genomes, we, we get partial information, but they're still individuals. But now we move down into this hyperreal zone. It's increasingly hyperreal when we get into the metagenomes. Because uh, if you just take those reads, remember we talked about the reads coming from uh, the environment and we, and we assemble them, uh, we, we have certain uncertainty as to the taxonomy of those contexts and their origin. And then when we assemble them into metagenome assembled genomes, Again, we, we may have uncertainty around them because that genotype may not exist in the actual environmental sample. And so that's what I'm talking about by, by having a, a sense of how precise are the labels, the taxonomic labels, and how complete is the genotype that I'm working with? Because if we wanna do metabolic pathway reconstruction and we work with partial genotypes, then our precision drops precipitously, right? Because we need unity to predict the pathway space. And even then, you know, 40% of the genes may be hypothetical. So we, we're working with imperfect information there, but at least we have more certainty that that is the cellular network than uh, we do down here at, in, in, the, in the increasingly hyperreal zone of metagenomics. 
And so I talked about these metagenome assembled genomes as, as being constructs. These are bins of related contigs. So in each case that we put the puzzle pieces for that genotype together based on various properties. Um, and those properties could be things like GC content, uh, KMER profiling, where we, we break up the genome into these strings of, of, of Gs, As, Ts, and Cs of different length, and we identify their frequency distribution. And, you know, genomes that are related to each other have similar KMER distribution profiles. And so we can statistically identify, based on um, that information, uh, essentially clouds of related contigs. And here's an example of an ordination plot where we're visualizing Kamer distribution profile of uh, related organisms. Here, these are marine group A bacteria, but we can see that there are um, discrete bins in which we can now ass assign metabolic functions to each of those bins. There, are, they would be population level groupings that have certain types of enzymatic features. And this is really important because even at this level, we're able to start to ask questions about metabolism. Like, do they all have a core metabolism? Do they all do some things the same? Do they do they share, like I showed you in the population distribution of the of A to B to C, does you know, one carry out the first step of a reaction? Does another carry out the second? And do they even co-occur in the environment? And so could you imagine them as working together to, to solve that objective? The other one I mentioned was single cell amplified genomes. This is very expensive compared to the shotgun sequencing that generates mags, uh, uses flow cytometry to individually sort cells into uh, plates, into wells and plates, and we can amplify those genomes. And that's giving us much more accurate taxonomic labeling, but incomplete information because we can't reassemble uh, typically the whole, the whole genome. Uh, but we can do some pretty interesting things. And this is a typical quality control profile for single cell amplified genomes where we might plot things like co contamination versus completion of the, the, the rendered single cell genomes. And this is data from a paper we recently published in scientific data of uh, single cell genomes from around the world, global ocean uh, oxygen minimum zone. So we worked with many different labs that were generating this type of data. We, we combine it into one unified data set, and we started to, to, to ask questions about what is shared between these different oxygen minimum zones at the single cell level. Uh, so what I'm talking about here is we have these two different types of data streams. We have the, the plurality sequence, the whole genome shock and sequencing data that we're trying to bin, and we have now increasingly access to single cell resolution. And really, ideally, in the future, we'll find ways to put them together, right, to increase the precision of our labeling, both from the standpoint of taxonomy and gene function and completeness with respect to this is a representation of the full metabolic network within that population or within that uh, set of individual cells so that we can then do better prediction, because that's where we're headed, right? We're headed towards modeling the metabolic properties of, of the individuals, the populations, and the communities. And so, you know, you've heard the saying, gar you know, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, I've heard that biochemists say, why waste clean thinking on dirty enzymes? And I, I would say the same thing here. You know, we don't want to spend a lot of time working with these imperfect data sets uh, if we can help it. Okay. So this is just an example of what you could imagine. Here's a whole population of different uh, genotypes that are being binned in mass through an automation procedure, combining single cell genomes and uh, metagenome assembled genomes so that we have the ability to resolve these and then go back to this question, right? If I've resolved all these different colors on the tree, I should be able to have more confidence in the frequency distribution of those uh, genes encoding you know, each reaction step, okay. And that is the hierarchy. So I, what I want to talk about is how do we move through this hierarchy computationally? And so this is putting the pieces back together again, but with particular software that is enabling because we certainly can't do it manually. And this is where Metabolic Pathways for the whole community comes in to play. And over the years, my lab has built this Meta Pathways uh, workflow. It combines a lot of open source tools that have been developed and you're probably familiar with, with some in-house uh, development that we've done. And of course, we've strung it all together into a form that, that, that works uh, on different uh, compute resources. And so the simple way of thinking about uh, pathways and what maybe makes it different from other workflows uh, is that it 
culminates in the production of what we're calling an environmental pathway genome database or an EPGDB. And so to summarize, MetaPathways is an open source framework. It provides these useful data products, in, in, including tables of gene frequencies or pathway frequencies, but importantly, it creates an, a pathway genome database. And that is uh, compatible with pathway tools that SRI has developed. So you can take the output of MetaPathways and you can go visualize it using pathway tools. So the kinds of inputs that it, that it ingests, uh, give it nucleotide sequences, GenBank files, GFF files, although that can be a problem if people have different structures to their tables. Uh, raw sequencing data, FASTQ, uh, and we're working on other formats. And so to give a little bit more of the granular detail on the workflow, it, you know, it uses the standard assembly. We have to put the pieces together uh, in, and we bin forming from contigs. We wanna find those, those population genomes. Uh, we go through a whole series of quality control and ORF prediction. Uh, we use, again, standard tools like here. We use Prodigal for that purpose. Uh, and then we search a whole variety of databases that allow us, uh, once we've predicted the other open reading frames and trans, uh, conceptually translated them, to assign some kind of product descriptions to them based on homology. And then we have a number of custom modules that we've built over the years that allow for that lowest common ancestor calculation, uh, some gene-centric analysis, uh, coverage, uh, RPKM or TPM coverage and so forth. But the key is that the whole process is very structured. And as I said, it culminates in the production of this environmental pathway genome database. Okay. And so what is this thing? It, it facilitates the pathway centric exploration of environmental sequence information. And it, it's, it's built on the MetaPsych hierarchy. It's using the, the uh, annotated, curated and, and annotated uh, pathways that are present in MetaPsych. Uh, and it allows us to um, approach metabolic reconstruction at the individual, the population, and the, the community level uh, based on explicit rules. And uh, Pathway Tools uses uh, uh, a rule-based uh, algorithm called Pathologic to, to ask, given the, the data, what is the likelihood that a, a pathway exists in that data? Um, and this is the pathologic statement here. Uh, it's key to generating the pathway genome database from, from the entries we provide uh, from, uh, from MetaPathways. And once you've created that data structure, that pathway genome database from pathologic, you can then use the pathway genome navigator, the editors, and there's even flux balance that can be supported through, through the pathway tools suite. MetaPsych, which is that hierarchy of information, is sort of the non-redundant version of the biocyte collection that SRI has put together for many different uh, organismal uh, genomes. And so it's the multi-organismal non-redundant collection of all of the different pathways and reactions that have been, have been curated with literature citations. And so the current version 27.1 actually has over 3,000 pathways, over 18,000 reactions and you know, over 50,000 pathway associated literature, literature citations. So Ron Caspi at SRI has been really busy. And, and I think it's, it's fair to say this is probably the most precise database we could use if we're trying to understand metabolism. So the schema of an EPGDB looks like this. This is the same if you had done it with an organism, by the way. This is what we will do for the community level. Uh, data set at this point, but you could do this for each individual genotype uh, just as well. We have the genomic map, the set of genes and ORFs, the gene products. We have that uh, rendered through compounds, reactions, and pathways uh, through pathologic uh, that then feeds into this, this data structure we call a PGDB that allows us then to visualize and enumerate those, those self-same features. Uh, this is an example of what you can do with the Pathway Genome Navigator from SRI. So it's it's like a Wikipedia for metabolism for your sample. There are evidence glyphs that simplify the metabolic overview. You can interact with the, the metabolic pathway, zooming in, zooming out, and you can actually go all the way in and, and look at individual reactions and, and learn about them. So it's it's a powerful framework. When, when you think about it in the context of microbial community metabolism, so here's an example of that cellular overview. This is the set of reactions and metabolic pathways that are present in that community. Uh, you can then zoom in and ask, you know, what are they and how are those, this is that frequency distribution, how are they distributed? Uh, and then you can go all the way down to the level of the individual green frame if you want. 
So we validated uh, that, that process uh, going through individual isolate genomes through synthetic mock communities to some real world examples. And I just want to focus a little bit on those real world examples here. And you're thinking about metabolism uh, you know, and that objective function, not just at the individual level, but at the population and, and community levels as well. So one thing we, we can do just from a synthetic biology or engineering point of view is we can say if we, if we have two organisms and we want to ask what kind of emergent metabolic properties they might have together, like we want to grow them together, and we want to make something that neither one can make by themselves, we can model that using a pathway genome database approach. Uh, and in this case, you know, we put two organisms together and we found that a new pathway emerged that could produce a new bioproduct. Okay. Uh, in this case, we can look at symbiosis. And here's mealybugs. This is work from John McCutcheon's group where uh, two uh, endosymbionts coexist, um, Tremblia and Morinella, and they have very, very reduced genomes. The mealybug cannot make essential amino acids, but neither can Tremblia or Morinella. But when you put their genomes together, using, again, a pathway genome database approach, you can see that for many of the essential amino acids that you have uh, together, Morinella and Tremblia encode those steps to make the final product. So this is a classic example of that distributed metabolism that I was mentioning earlier as a concept, but it, it really does exist in, in the natural world. Uh, we also took that to the Hawaii Ocean Time Series as proof of concept because uh, DeLong's group had published a really nice 454 data set where they had both uh, genomic DNA, but they also had transcriptomics that were mapped or, or matching to the, to the metagenomes. So we could ask at the pathway level, um, do we see, you know, can we predict a pathway, but then is that pathway expressed in, in the environment? So here it goes down to about 500 meters from the upper euphotic down to the mesopelagic. Here's a cellular overview example of at 25 meters. This is the metabolism of the ocean, literally, at 25 meters um, at hot. So that's pretty cool. And we can compare the set of pathways that are predicted versus the set that are predicted and expressed here shown in red. So you can see the latent metabolic potential as well as the expressed metabolic potential at the community level. Uh, you can do the set difference. You can ask, you know, at the different depths, are there is there a core set of pathways? Are there unique pathways? The bottom line is that 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 more than six hundred pathways were predicted uh, and shared in common between the sunlit and the dark ocean. So the pathway distribution is is pretty homogeneous. However, this is where it gets really interesting. If you and I'll spend a few minutes on this uh, sequence. If if we just look at the light, these would be uh, pathways now, not individual genes, but pathways that are active uh, in the photic zone. So here you, we have DNA on uh, the colors from green to red, and RNA from from green to red. But we've changed up the the, the color spectrum there a little bit to more brick red, uh, and we have the different depths, twenty five, seventy five, and in a in a stacked histogram here and we have the relative ORF abundance, you can see that there are examples on the, on the um, right-hand side is the DNA and on the left-hand side is the RNA. What you can see is that these light pathways are present at most of the depths, all the way down to 500 meters, but they're only expressed on the left-hand side in those depths that receive sunlight. And that's pretty cool. And that included, of course, photosynthesis is a sanity check. Yes, it's expressed where there's sunshine, hydrogen production and vitamin, e, vitamin B synthesis. So, so this was good from a proof of concept point of view that we're getting certain types of reactions we expect to be expressed. Uh, so our predictive model seems to be doing, doing well. And the same thing happens in the dark. Like even though the pathways are distributed uh, at many depths, they're really only expressed at 500 meters. And these would include things like uh, organic matter degradation, nitrification, we actually picked up a denitrification signal at, at HUDS, which we didn't believe. And this points to hazards with this type of approach when you're modeling. Um, so here in the nitrogen cycle, what we found is that, that uh, pathologic couldn't distinguish between nitrate reduction and nitrite oxidation at that time. And so we had to go in and manually curate this step because what it was calling denitrification was actually nitrate oxidation based on the gene expression profile from nitrospira. And so this isn't a, a denitrification in fully oxic waters. This is a nitrite oxidation signal. Finally, we applied this um, to viruses. Uh, this is not published. There's other work that 
that Matt's group has been doing on this that supersedes what I'm showing you here. But we were just curious, this is old Tara Oceans data, and we wanted to ask, um, if we took a pathway-centric view of AMG distribution patterns in the global ocean using our pathway tools approach in, in meta pathways, uh, what would we find? And, and you know, there was a core set of pathways, uh, 111 actually, that were found pretty well throughout the virome. Uh, but the pathway level clustering actually seemed to group by depth. So as you go from the surface, the sunlit into the deeper, darker waters, right at the uh, like uh, the right at the tip of the mesopelagic. So you see the mesopelagic AMGs are clustering together, and then we have the the the, the sunlight AMG groupings clustering together. And we could identify metabolic hotspots for AMG selection across the metabolic map. So this is work that continues to unfold, and hopefully there'll be modeling papers that come out in the future. But I thought this was very exciting because viruses modulate the network I showed you. It's not just archaea and bacteria forming these connections. It's the viruses that are moving genes between them and modulating the expression of pathways within cells that really need to be considered. We're trying to build a compendium. Uh, we have built the Environmental Genome Encyclopedia, which you can think of as the fourth tier of, um, of biopsych that contains all this environmental information. Uh, this is alive. It exists. It's just not full yet. We need more people to work with. Uh, we've started with the, the metagenome assembled genomes from the JGI GEM study, and we, we're building uh, uh, pathway genome databases for those environments and MAGs. And I just want to end on a couple of caveats that this approach cannot predict pathways that are not present in metapsych, so it's limited in scope. Uh, it's hard to find small or short pathways. Um, there are definitely false positives. I, I uh, alluded to the hazard of, of the denitrification pathway. Uh, we don't have good taxonomic assignment tools in metapathways yet, but we're moving towards GTDB as our, as our gold standard, so we're getting better at that. Uh, and of course, there's limited functional validation for every pathway we predict in a metagenome. So just take that with a grain of salt. So in conclusion, you know, what I've told you about is that you know, we live in this world dominated by microorganisms. We have a conceptual model of how they operate at the individual, the population and community levels. We need computational tools that allow us to take a pathway-centric approach across those different levels, essentially forming an um, environmental pathway genome database collection that uh, can be accessed and compared and used as a source of information. And here's the final, final part about that is that if we are going to use this information, so I give you this number of 10 to the 30 archaea and bacteria that are organized as networks, not as linear models, we need to have these search functions in place like metapathways so that will inform our metabolic engineering efforts. So if we're going to be synthesizing genes or building pathways and host chassis, we're going to need a framework, I think, that builds on ecological design principles so that we can actually build bioprocesses that serve us in the Anthropocene. And I will end on this final, final note, which is a quote from Aldo Leopold from 1949. And I think it's very relevant to everything we're doing. The extension of ethics so far studied only by philosophers is actually a process in ecological evolution. Its sequences may be described in ecological as well as in philosophical terms. An ethic ecologically is a limitation on freedom of action and the struggle for existence. An ethic philosophically is a differentiation of social from antisocial conduct. There are two definitions of the same thing. The thing has its origin in the tendency of interdependent individuals or groups to evolve modes of cooperation. We as human beings really need to learn that lesson. Microbes should be able to teach us. They've been doing it for billions of billions of years. And I, I think we just need to pause and listen. And I will end there. Stephen. <clears throat> uh, if anybody has questions, you can put them in the chat or you can raise your hand. Um, while people are getting to that, uh, Stephen, there's lots of questions that I have there. I'm thinking of a pragmatic one because of this being very new for, for trainees, uh, for anybody in the field that, you know, looking at pathway process is challenging. You've produced, you've suggested meta pathways. There's, of course, Ambio has its own tool, pathways and modules, and there's DRAM. Is there, can you give us the high level pros and cons of you would use one over the other, try all three? Well, clearly I'm biased, yep. but uh, <laughs> you know, ease of use is usually the, the 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 demarcation. I think most of us will gravitate towards whatever software we can deploy on the assets that we have. 
And if you can't install my software, you're not going to use it. And I know that's been an issue in the past, and we're trying to fix that. Uh, and so that's the bottom line. Like, if you know, DRAM is relatively easy to use, and so people gravitate towards it because because of that. Um, all of these tools have limitations, and I think it's just important for us to acknowledge that. NVO is 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 good. It it just the learning curve there is. I'd say if you go from complexity, uh, DRAM is probably the easiest to use, and then Meta Pathways, and then NVO. But uh, NVO has lots of functionality too. So yeah, I I I, I agree. Uh, that there are other ways of approaching this problem. But I will say that to my knowledge, this is the MetaPathways is the only tool that actually uses pathologic as, as a, 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 a pathway prediction engine. Most of the other, if not all the other tools are basically using KEG, uh, uh, Brenda hierarchy, KEG modules, uh, and that's okay. It's just different. It's a different um, algorithmic approach. Hey, base offers a lot of tools to it. Yeah, go ahead. Right, you said that flux a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. You're going to in these pathways, and so presumably you're meaning flux balances and genome scale modeling. Are you thinking about that at a community level, or? Well, we do think about it. Uh, <laughs> realizing that is much more difficult. Uh, you know, Dan Segre's group has has built wonderful packages uh, for, for trying to do this kind of modeling. I, I would start there. Uh, we, that's where we're at. We're still trying to, you know, use uh, comets and, uh, and, and, and those various applications from the Segre group. Um, we haven't actually used the, uh, the indigenous Metaflux tool from, from Pathway Tools at this point. Uh, it's just very difficult to validate the models. I think that the, the resistance that I've had personally of going that far is it's an aspiration, but we don't necessarily have the ability to fill in the gap between what we predict and what the truth is. Yeah, for the OSU community, one of the exciting new hires here is Karna Gauda, who um, is comes from the applied math and developing genome scale models for microbes. But what he did is he went took the microbial diversity course and learned how to make the measurements at scale. And so he yeah. was one of the rare modelers trying to do the wet lab work to test these flux-based predictions. And um, and he has some beautiful genomic trait predictions that come out of that work. So I, I agree, Stephen, that's a really important space. Oh, I agree. I know him well, and uh, he he's excellent. Oh, that's great. Yeah. <laughs> Um, are there some questions in the group? I don't want to take too many. Ah, in the chat. Do you want to unmic and ask your question? And then Daryl? Yeah, so are there any good reviews that compare these types of mapping tools um, that are out there? Because it seems to be a lot. I know like Carve Me is one that I was looking at more recently, but mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any any papers that have been comparing these types of tools. Um, against like a standardized set community and seeing what the different type, kinds of outputs are against like a ground truth. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's fantastic. Um, let's write one. So, you know, you, you probably heard about the critical assessment uh, series and CAMI, and they have not yet done one for pa pathway or metabolic modeling, but that would be a great one for the community to, to do. So there, while there are reviews that um, will introduce you to, flux balance, uh, constraint-based modeling. And Dan Segre is a great source. If you really want to read about them, go just look up him and there'll be a whole series of great reviews. Um, but as far as a contemporary comparative framework, no. There okay, should be. Thank you. Daryl, you had a question? Yeah, I was just wondering what your thoughts are on incorporating metabolite measurements into the models. And I am not naive enough to think you can measure metabolism, but can you measure parts of metabolism or how many nodes do you need to get in a pathway to get some information uh, potentially about movement through the system? How would you go about doing that? Uh, and, you know, and the computationally, how do you integrate that data? What are you guys thinking about that? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, another fantastic question, because uh, obviously 
biological information flows, you know, DNA, if we, maybe there's sometimes that it goes backwards, but generally speaking, the hysteresis is, you know, DNA, RNA, protein, metabolites, and metabolites can be, uh, you know, a variety of different outputs. It could be lipid parts. It, it, it could be carbohydrate parts. It could be small molecules. And we really need to increasingly measure that, that progression, because that's how you go from genotype to phenotype. Like we want to be able to like bridge those gaps. Um, it's hard in this type of science though, like for all those reasons I said that you, you, you're you dealing with emergent properties at the community level. And how do you accurately assign those metabolites to, you know, a given set of nodes in that, in that network. Uh, now it's a model that you build to say these two nodes should be producing X. Can I measure X? I think that would be as the best we can do. Like uh, we predict from the model that these two organisms together should be producing something or this one organism in the network should be producing it. And then we go and we, we, we measure it. And I, actually, I think like Kelly Wrighton's group had done some work like that from the fracking fluids where they had this interesting organism, but they had the benefit of it almost like being a monoculture. Well, yeah, when yeah. you get into like more than two or three member communities, I think the problem just gets really complicated fast. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with that. It's um, and it's hard for me to think about like how you actually integrate it and get value from that. It yeah. seems to be like let's integrate metabolites, but well, yeah. I would I would hazard the way that I I think we need this is now I'm going to get on my soapbox is uh, so in in the Comets paper. It, which is old now, but it's still, I think, if you haven't read it, it's a great paper from Segre's group. Um, what they did, you know, they're modelers. And so, you know, like, they're really good at the math, but okay, it's a model. Like, how do you validate? Well, they actually validated their model in this paper. They actually grew isolates. You know, they could say, here, we predict, it. here's what it does by itself. Here's what we do when we put the two together. Here's what we do when we put the three together. They did it. And they showed how the actual empirical evidence connected with with the with the model, and they they did up to three member uh, community. So they built that, and 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 I'd say we need a lot more of that. Like we need synthetic communities where we we know all the individual members, and we can put them together, and then we can measure the metabolic outputs. That we can we can make sense of. That's where and we NSF, should. And it's up as a synthetic community, and there's some folks at Ohio State trying to develop multiple PI groups around that. So if you're interested, yeah. Yeah. Uh, reach out to comms and we can try to help connect. Yeah, because um, if you so have a, by the way, just going back to the question of the viruses, because, you know, we know the viruses carry these accessory metabolic genes and we have ideas about how they might influence metabolism, but we don't have a lot of like evidence. There's, a few. There's some studies, Matt's even done some of them, but uh, we don't know. How, like at the, when we talk about biogeochemistry, we just don't know. And so if we could figure out a system to study the carbon cycle and effects that way, it would be pretty, pretty compelling. That's the work we're trying to bring you to <laughs> with the community metabolic models. Um, I see another question or two in the chair. Um, Hu Ning, uh, do you want to unmic and ask your question? In the oh, yeah, sure. So I have a question about like which database we should use to like in terms of defining a pathway. So yeah. like I know you mentioned Metastack, but uh and also CAG has been widely used in the in this field. And mm -hmm. I know Anvil like um like builds the metabolism component based on the CAG database. So I was wondering if we want to compare the metabolic pathways encoded in ocean, like microbes and the viruses, which pathway database like would you recommend we use? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we we don't actually go with keg directly. We go through like Uniref or Unipro, and we can pull EC numbers mm -hmm. from that and then map those onto the, the hierarchy. Uh, so we used to have a version of the keg database, but we we decided that we would let other databases curate all of that information and compile it, and then we would just pull uh, from them. So so, but your question is really great because the database is so key to to you know what you find, what the answer is, and so especially when we're running uh, pathway tools, and when we run pathologic, pathologic likes its own input. It 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 it, it takes EC numbers, it ingests EC numbers. But SRI can assign EC numbers. 
So they're they're licensed to create new EC numbers. And so if you did a set difference between keg and metacyc, they, they, they're not perfectly overlapping. There are EC numbers in metacyc that do not exist in keg and, and vice versa. And so if if and I don't have a solution for how you unify all of that information. And so what we typically do is is you know we 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 do a kind of a a keg study where we use the keg data and we okay what do we find there and then we do a metapsych study and we and then we compare them and we 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 see what there is to to find. Um, we've actually been moving away from having many many databases in, that, that are used in meta pathways. We we've, we've learned like it's a law of diminishing returns because the compute gets way more expensive. And so we've been trying to find sort of the minimal set of databases that, that are you know, of sufficient quality to get the answer. Yeah. Stephen, you've got a and question it, from Garrett. Oh, go ahead, Funing, did you have a follow up? Yeah, so if I can just follow up. Uh, so when you compare the, like you mentioned the CAC study and the MetaSec study, and then you make the comparison. So mm -hmm. when you do, when you compare uh, the two databases, do you often find the consistency there or not? Well, this is the, the challenge with the comparisons is that, um, uh, oh, I, I'm sorry, I was sharing all the slides. I thought maybe yeah, I would no go problem. back to one. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, the challenge is that the hierarchies are different. And so the, ont the ontology, the categorical information, the naming in their in their hierarchies, doesn't always allow for a one-to-one -one comparison. So like there's no universal ontology. I mean, there is, we just don't all use it. <laughs> you know, people working with, with the human genome might use it, but uh, we don't have that yet at a community level. So it's more about biological interpretation and you have to know metabolism. You can go, oh yeah, yeah, those are, carbohydrate related, you know, like people with knowledge then have to go through and say, oh yeah, yeah, those are basically saying the same thing. Uh, you know, there are a number of EC numbers shared in common. So that, that's one way to do it at, at the level of reactions. You're just like, yep, they found the same EC numbers. So, so we're good. It's, it's just around the edges where, where you're going to see differences. Tomer Altman has a good paper where he compares Metapsych and Keg. It's a little old now, but it's a good paper. Garrett, you want to jump in with your question? I think several people working in this space would be interested in that one. Sure. Um, yeah, so my question uh, relates to your uh, the hazard you mentioned with the denitrification versus the nitri oxidation. Um, yeah. So, you know, these ambiguous enzymes are kind of abound in microbes, whether it's uh, reversible or evolutionary related with slightly different functionalities or just, you know, participating in different pathways because there's a precursor for a variety of different things. Mm -hmm. um, so I was curious how uh, either Metapathways does or how you would like to handle these ambiguous um, genes or reactions on a large scale like you, you are trying to do. Yeah. Well, Matt made me take that out. <laughs> No, in, in all I knew I'd get in trouble for that. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Uh, we, yeah, it, that's another fantastic question. I, I mean, you're, you're just going right to all my, my uh, pain points here. The, the, uh, I don't, I don't know how to solve that entirely. But what I do know is that there's, a, if we take a gene centric approach to that particular problem, and we can, and we can say based on the biochemistry, if we, we look and we place that particular, let's say that that nitrate reductase that's yeah. actually doing the opposite reaction, then uh, we can find that in a phylogenetic space. Yeah. And then we can use that as, as a feature, as, as, a, as a weighting for, the, for that feature and say, yep, that's most likely involved in the reverse reaction. Okay. Oh, in our case, so we had to use a biological. What's using that? the organismal context, right? You're basically saying these genes all came from this them, and in that organism, we think it's X. But also, I would, I would have thought it would have been uh, the chemical. numbers. Of the, yeah, it's we no, we wanted to would have been the, go ahead. Yeah, no, sorry, there's a lag. <laughs> I would I would have thought it would have been um, you know, there's two pathways and you have gene representation for the other genes in one pathway, but not this pathway. 
Well, that's okay. I, I I'll get there. That that so there's okay. the, there's a gene centric approach where we just take and we've built tools that we, we have something called TreeSap, where you build a reference package and you know there's a, a hidden Markov model, uh, there's a there's a, a phylogenetic tree, there's a you know a, a, a table, uh, and those have to be curated manually. But once you've assigned that feature space, it does pretty well at differentiating in this case that that particular hazard. But you can't do that for all the genes that we have out there. It's too much. It's too it's computationally. We just can't do it all. We do it on a gene by gene basis. Matt's point is there are approaches that what you've articulated is called the multiple mapping problem, for instance, where an EC number shows up in multiple pathways because of a common uh, substrate or, or, or product. And, and then what you do is uh, there, are, there are like integer uh, programming based approaches that will go in and 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 say okay you know i found this is this is a common ec number but four other reactions in this pathway were found and only one was found in this pathway that they share you know the, the reaction in common so therefore it is more likely that this the former pathway is present so that gets the weighting and so that that is that is what we're that's the state of the art right now yeah Questions from the group. I, I put a link into to the com comments paper that uh, Stephen has mentioned from Daniel Segre's lab a couple times, as well as to TreeSap as mentioned, which is the phylogenetic approach to sort of dis disentangle those redundant pathway. <clears throat> Any other questions from the group here? Thanks for uh, who's hanging on. I can tell many of you are in the space. <laughs> I, have, I have a question uh, related yeah. to phonics. Um, yeah, so yeah. you mentioned like. Yeah, so I saw that uh, there is a few other databases like uh, uh, G K -O K -O K -O K -E -G -G. There is also um, another one, G Gene, Gene Authology, right? Yeah. And so, so those are all referred to. So you when you identify those um, annotations, so you first uh, match them to the Uniref database, then use the Uniref. Correct. But, uh, then uh, match to the other databases. Uh, so is that's that that's, yes? That's what we do. The, the the one thing though is with MetaPsych, people do this. That's a tra we you know that's kind of a transitive approach where like you find it you and you 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 know you do your lookup and you find an ID. The one differentiator with respect to pathway tools is that it it runs the pathologic algorithm, which makes a prediction of whether the pathway is present or not. This is different from what you would get if you just searched a database and said, oh, look, I, I've mapped n number of genes to this keg module, okay? There's there's no there, there's no like likelihood estimation at that point that that pathway exists. Like we have to create that algorithmic solution. And th there are ways to do that with keg, don't get me wrong, there, there are, tools now that allow you to, to say like that multiple mapping problem, for example. But if you if you just uh, transitively take the MetaPsych identifier from a, like Univref or from IMGM, no one ran pathologic on that data. Okay. And so I don't I don't like to use that assignment. I would rather run pathologic and get the the, the output of pathologic that says given the data, this is the that that pathway is present. Yep. Yeah. The really green part. Of, yeah. The really. Uh, 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 so you mentioned that you send the the, the metagenomic binding and the single cell genes into the microbial genome, and those approaches they typically can help us, you know, uh, reconstruct some sort of really uh, species, uh, really novel and unknown, right? So it may contain some like unknown genes, genomes. So I would um, can you share some uh, some thoughts like how we better to uh, um, um, annotate those something that probably unknown. How do we handle any hypotheticals as oh. we explore the new taxa? Yeah, well, you know, we need a whole research uh, a grant like a, a, a NSF. Or somebody should just do the whole program around the hypotheticals. We call it the hypothetical program. Uh, yeah, it's it's a really hard problem. Um, you know, 
most of what we know of biochemistry comes from just a, a small number of organisms that people study in the laboratory. And that's because we want to use the scientific method to validate things yeah. and, and, and constrain all the way down to the mechanistic level. And now, you know, we're in this big data era where everything is based on uh, similarity. And, you know, for the most part, I, I think we're getting a lot right. You know, if I, if I search a, 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 a database of carbohydrate active enzymes and I find a GH3 or GH5 hit, generally when I go and I express that and I test it in the lab, it's a GH3 or it's a GH5. But the problem it comes in with enzyme promiscuity, for example. And like the, the, the work people are doing on microplastic degradation is a good example. Like cutinases are very abundant enzyme class in the environment. Some of them work on microplastics, but others don't. And there's no like one active site that defines whether you're going to break down plastic or whether you're going to break down cutin or, or, or a relative. So it, it's a, it's so, a hard, hard problem to infer directly without doing that, that validation step. And so, I, you know, my point is if you're interested in a pathway, you know, don't stop at the list that you've predicted of here are all the, here's that frequency distribution of, of alleles. It's, it's, it's cheap now to synthesize, make them and test them. So Stephen, I'm just going to end with a philosophical question for you. Then. Yeah. It, it, there's clearly in your mind, sort of a need at a community level, researcher need level to uh -huh. come together in some sort of, you know, distributed jamborees, annotation jamborees, combine some flavor of, you know, functional experiments with novel and interesting and expert guided annotation. Is that what you think we need to do as a, as a community to figure out how to fund something like get buy-in broadly? Yeah, I, we need the universities to have programs that do this. We need to have the infrastructure. By the way, we have to have the infrastructure to do it. It's not cheap. Uh, people have to have access to the funding to sustain these programs. We have to integrate it into education. These shouldn't be things you do as graduate students. These are things you should be doing in capstone projects and undergraduate curriculum. I mean, it's big. It's the whole, it's the whole ecosystem level that we have to modify. Uh, and of course, if there aren't resources to do that, it's, it's simply going to happen in small events like sparks at night. And there'll be this moment of, wow, but then it's, you know, it's gone. Great. Well, listen, thanks so much for staying and everything. I know that your time is very precious and really appreciate you joining us. You can see there's a lot of interest here and in the, in the, the science space you're thinking about. So appreciate it. Well, I just want to say um, thank you all for your for attention. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Happy to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah.